Would you turn, please, to Genesis chapter 1? <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Final readings, please, in the gospel written by John. John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Now notice in verse 14 what John tells us about this being called the word. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the father. Full of grace. Truth. I would like to look with you tonight at three basic but vital questions. And what I hope to do is just be very brief and clear the path for my dear brother to proclaim the gospel and to tell you how you can come to Christ tonight. Here are the questions. Is there a God? Number two, are we accountable to that God? And number three, how can we be right with God? Is there a God? Now, I think we better start with an indisputable fact that no one can argue with. In our physical world, nothing comes from nothing. To have something, then first of all, you have to have had something. Julie Andrews had it right. Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever can. Physically speaking, I have nothing in my hand right now. Tell me how long we would have to wait until an apple tree appeared in my hand. Let's make that simpler. How long would I have to wait until an apple, a single apple, appeared in my hand? Make it even simpler. How long would we have to wait until just a seed, an apple seed, appeared out of nothing in my hand? Now, you could put a seed into my hand, or the wind could blow a seed into my hand. But unless an intelligent being or some force does something, nothing is going to appear in my hand because nothing comes from nothing. So go back as far as you can think. And you will be told in your biology classes and elsewhere, you'll be told that there were there was something. There were amoebas, there were electrons, there was a, they love this term, there was primordial soup, right? Go back as far as you can and then ask yourself the question, where did the amoebas, where did the electrons, where did the primordial soup come from? You will be told, well, they were just there. Well, then you're admitting that there's something that's eternal, that's before time, that was just there. Well, we admit that too. Well, I'd like to ask you, what do you think is more logical? That there was someone who is eternal or that there was something that is eternal? So ask yourself these simple questions. When you see design and order, do you generally think it came from someone or something? Now, this tent is a fairly simple design. There are pipes going into brackets. There are pins holding the pipes in the brackets. And then there is vinyl material stretched over the entire structure. When you came in, did you think that this was designed by somebody and put together by somebody? Or do you think that it just happened to appear? When you see purpose, and meaning behind something. Do you think somebody did that or it was just an accident? For instance, there are wires running at different parts of this tent and they're going to outlets and there are lights and fans plugged in. Do you think that that was designed? Do you think that that had a purpose, that somebody was behind that? And when we detect vast, almost infinite information that's safely stored somewhere, do we think that it came from someone or from something? This is a very simple thing right here. John 3, 16, the body of the text, if I count correctly, it has 113 letters. If you add in the reference, the punctuation, and the spacing, then there are just over 150 components to this very simple chart hanging in front of you. Do you think that this chart was made by someone, or do you think that this simple, simple chart was the product of a storm that hit some paint and brushes and material and somehow slapped those words up there. 
I'm being purposely ridiculous because when you look at the world around you, do you think it came from nothing? When everything we realize in our world has to come from something, Christians feel that the most logical answer to these questions is that someone, a being, an intelligence, created everything. Just as the Bible says in the beginning, God created. But of course, when you think about a being, an intelligence who is eternal, well, then you've come over to our side because that's the definition of God. Look around you and you will see in creation design and order and information. Every cell in your body has a library of information. Now, there are many, many, many intelligent people who came to understand that there was a God. Isaac Newton, he wrote more about the Bible than he did about science. Johannes Kepler, the famous astronomer, said that all he was doing was thinking God's thoughts after him. Wilder Smith was a, an evolutionist, a, an atheist. And when he studied evolution, this scientist came to understand that the evidence for evolution was so flimsy that he turned to the Bible and he became a believer in creation and in God. On the other hand, there have been many intelligent, learned, erudite people who don't believe in a God. So please, don't listen to what other people say. Judge for yourself whether there is a God. Don't ask yourself, well, where do most people think or who's really, really the most smart here? Because I'm telling you, there are people on both sides of the fence. But what I have discovered is that many people don't want to believe in a God because that means they would be accountable to him. We are accountable to that God. We are the ones who wrecked his creation. We are the ones who brought sin into the world. God locked the system down. I hope you have some sort of antivirus or anti ransomware on your computer. You've got to guard it and protect it because there are forces that want to get into your hard drive, steal information from you. God locked the whole system down, put the key into the hand of Adam and told him, now, Adam, see the garden here? It's all yours. Enjoy the whole thing. See that tree there? Just that one. That's mine. You can have every, every one of the other trees, just that one's mine. Don't touch that. And Adam took the key and unlocked the door and flung it open and brought in sin and death and misery and heartache. Don't you think it makes sense that the God who is there would want to fix his creation? Because sin not only ruined his creation, it ruined his creatures, you, me. And it is a remarkable fact of the Bible that that infinite being who could simply have erased the planet and started all over again with a whole different kind of creature instead sent his own beloved son to provide a way to fix the problem, to provide a way to save you. Now, I've told you already that there are a number of people who do not like the thought of being accountable to God. I have no idea how young I was. I don't say how old I was, but I was probably about 10. And I said to my mother, why do some people say that there's no God? But please don't imagine I was especially precocious or especially intelligent. I was just curious. Why do some people say there's no God? She gave me what I thought was a really simplistic answer. Like, come on. She said, well, because if they admit there's a God, they have to admit that they have to face him. See, and I thought to myself, it was my mother now. She never went to college. Want to know something? I found out that the old girl knew pretty much, pretty much, because she nailed it. Let me give you the words of Thomas Nagel, professor of philosophy at one time at New York University. He said, I want atheism to be true. And I'm made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. What's he saying? I don't want that. The Christian writer, Paul Mosier, whose books I very much enjoy. He said he, he had a friend who said to him, 
If I had to admit that there was a God, I'd kill myself. What has sin done to us that has made us so annoyed and angry and, and opposed to God? It is because we do not want to have to answer to him. That whole concept that one day I'm going to have to stand before God and he is going to have the record of everything I have done. And I'm going to have to give account to God for how I have lived and what I did about his son. That is something that we would love to just erase and somehow bypass and never have to face. So while Karl Marx said that the opium of the people was religion, I will tell you what the real opium of the people is. The idea that when you die, there's nothing else. That when you die, you don't need God. That's the thing that clouds the mind. That's the thing that turns off logical thinking. That's the thing that makes a person go through life dreaming and imagining all as well, only to head into eternity and face a nightmare of experience. Because you and I are accountable to that God. We are creatures. We are not sovereign entities. We are not beings who are answerable to no one. There is that tremendously solemn statement in the New Testament that God is the God with whom we have to do. The God with whom we have to do. That means it is inescapable. It is unavoidable. The God with whom we have to do. Now, please understand there are things in life that you have to do, but you really don't have to do them. You have to pay taxes. But you don't have to pay taxes. If you don't pay, you'll pay the penalty for not paying the taxes. You have to breathe. But you don't have to breathe. You could die. But you have to meet God. You have to meet God. And there is no escape. And there is no alternative. And there is no option. It doesn't matter whether a person blows his brains out or lives to be 105. You have to meet God. He is the God with whom we have to do. So the big question tonight, confronting every one of us, is how can I be right with that God? The God who's there, the God that I one day have to meet, how can I be right with God? Now, this is where the gospel, the Bible, Christianity, this is where it shines. Because here is a message, the one unique message in our world that tells us not what you have to do to be made right with God, but what God has done so that you can be right with him. That cuts the difference. That makes the difference. That draws the line between God's salvation and every humanly invented religion in the entire world. It doesn't matter what the religion calls itself. It doesn't matter what it, its philosophy seems to be. At the heart of it, at the basis of it, is the concept that there's something you can do to attain what you want to get to. If it's paradise or heaven or peace or nirvana, whatever it is, there are steps that you can take and deeds you can do and things you can perhaps practice that will get you there. And then the sublimely, wonderfully, breathtakingly simple message of the gospel is that Christ finished the work at Calvary. And instead of God's telling you what you have to do, God is telling you what his son has done he has made it possible for you to be right with god let me give you that in wonderful bible language i, I consider it one of the deepest statements in our bible when in romans chapter 5 paul writes to the christians and said that you were reconciled to god by the death of his son you were reconciled to god by the death of his son you know what reconciliation is Many times that has to do with interpersonal relationships. For instance, a, a husband and a wife are not getting along. And so they go to a counselor and, and that counselor mediates. You know, you know what the counselor tries to do? He tries to get the stubborn man to give in a little. And he tries to get the woman to give in a little and get them to meet on middle ground so that he can effect a reconciliation, get them back together. You know what the Lord Jesus said? He used a word that means just that. He said, now, if somebody has something against you, you go and be reconciled to him. And the word he used is you give in a little, he'll give in a little, and you'll meet in the middle. That is never the word used for God. Do you know the word that's used when it comes to reconciliation to God? It's not that he gives a little and we give in a little. It's that we're the guilty ones. 
that God is righteous and holy. And that the Lord Jesus came into the world to die on a cross so that he could reconcile us to God. That is part of the meaning of that wonderful gospel text in 1 Peter 3 and 18. Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. That has not only to do with our being brought into the presence of God in heaven, safe forever, but now here at present to be made right with God, to be reconciled to God, to have peace with God through the Lord Jesus. We who once were enemies in our minds, alienated from God, can be brought back to God because of the work of Christ at Calvary. It is likely that at some point you have heard about the Alka tribe. They actually, I think, call themselves, if I am pronouncing it correctly, the Wyadani. And you will remember the five missionaries who were martyred in Ecuador. As a result of their death and further work, the tribe was opened up to the gospel. Missionaries actually were allowed to live among them. And many of those Alka warriors were saved. The very man who threw the spear into Nate Saint became a Christian. Minkaya and said he'd throw his arms around Nate when he got to heaven and thank him for bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to him. But translators working with them were trying to translate the Bible into the language of the Wyadani. And the translator was having difficulty with the, with the word, the English word, reconcile. He couldn't, he couldn't find anything in their language that would convey the meaning of the word reconcile. And one day when they were traveling, they came to a, like a canyon. It wasn't very, very deep, it wasn't very far, but they could never jump it. And he noticed that the Wyadani took out machetes and they cut down a tree that was near the edge of the cliff. And the tree fell and hit the other side. And then that was a bridge for them and they walked over and they had a word for it. In their language, it was literally tree across the ravine. He said, say that word again. They said it again, tree across the ravine. And that is the word he used to reconcile. A bridge across the mighty chasm between God and you. Do you know who built that bridge? I know we sometimes sing there's a way back to God, but to be perfectly honest, there's a way from God, see, <laughs> from him to us that allows us to be made right with him. And that was done by the word who became flesh and went to the cross and died. He has made it possible for you to be right with that blessed God. You can be justified by faith in Christ. So you understand then you can be reconciled to God by the death of his son. That death, that work on the cross has made it possible. But the moment that a sinner puts faith in Christ and is justified, that's what makes it personal. When a sinner personally trusts Christ. Now, just for a moment, let's lay aside your religion. Let's lay aside your love for God. Let's lay aside your favoritism toward conservative issues. Let's, let, let's just put to the side your good character. And let's just dig right down to the foundation. And allow me to ask you, what is it? What is it that you are depending on? To take you to heaven. What is it that you are resting on? To take you to heaven. You see Luke recorded. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And he told us much of what an eyewitness could see. He told us about the blazing blinding light. He told us about Saul. Um, falling and hearing a voice from heaven. And, and the stunned reaction of this proud Pharisee. When he heard the Lord Jesus speaking to him from heaven. Luke records all of that in Acts chapter 9. But Paul. Tells us what Luke couldn't see. When Paul tells us exactly what happened in his mind in Acts chapter 9. And he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he said, I declare to you the gospel that I took to myself. Got that? That I took to myself. When Saul of Tarsus heard that voice calling from him, he was a Jewish rabbi. He was a proud Pharisee. He knew that that brilliant light was what Jews call the Shekinah. That was the glory of God. 
In other words, God would be encased, surrounded by that glory. But out from that glory, there comes a voice that says, you're persecuting me, Saul. Why? Saul thought he was serving God, and yet here's God telling him he's persecuting him. And he says, oh, who art thou, Lord? Now, the next three words in the English language caused Saul's entire life to collapse around his ears. Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. You know what happened? I was going to tell you he quickly realized this, but it's the spirit of God that opened his mind to grasp this. If Christ was there in the glory, then Christ was alive. And if Christ was in the glory of God, then Christ was no blasphemer. And if Christ was no blasphemer, then he didn't die for his sins. And Saul says, I took to myself how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then he succinctly, tersely, wonderfully phrased his whole theology in one glorious statement. Listen to it and catch how personal it is. The son of God loved me and he gave himself for me. The son of God loved me. Catch the motivation there. What was it that brought the Lord Jesus from heaven? The son of God loved me. Not loves me. Not he loves me. Paul, the apostle, serving and preaching and ready to die for him. No, no, no. He loved me when I hated him, when I cursed his name, when I killed his followers. He loved me. He came from heaven when I despised his name, hated his gospel. He loved me. Notice the crucifixion referred to, the sacrifice involved. He gave himself. This was the ultimate sacrifice. He gave us all. There's nothing more that Christ could have given to save you. And there's nothing more required because he gave himself. Notice the substitution involved. He loved me and gave himself for me. Highest for the lowest, the Lord, for the lost, the king, for the rebels, Jesus, for Paul, Jesus for me, because the son of God loved me and he gave himself for me. There was a diplomatic dinner in Washington, D.C. sometime after the Second World War. So Winston Churchill was asked, during the Second World War, what was the moment of greatest alarm? Where, where, where did you have the greatest fear for the outcome of the war? Surprisingly, he referred to April 1942, and the Japanese fleet was steaming toward Ceylon, what we now call Sri Lanka. And in his usual eloquent way, he said the entire Pacific theater would have been lost if it were not for a lone, unknown airman whose bones now lay whitened on the ocean floor. But standing there listening to the conversation was Lester Pearson, who was the ambassador of Canada, Canada's ambassador to the United States. And Mr. Pearson spoke up and said, that airman is neither unknown nor dead. He is RCAF officer Len Burchill. And at the time that Mr. Pearson was saying that, Len Burchill lived in Kingston, Ontario. He died in September of 2004, but at that time, he was living in Kingston. Len Burchill was flying his plane, trolling the Indian Ocean. He's up in his Catalina, see? And suddenly he sees the Japanese fleet. And the moment that he spots them, they spot him. Six zeros took off from the aircraft carrier. They had to bring him down because they could not afford to have their location radio. Len Burchill had got on his radio immediately and he had sent the information. They shot him out of the sky, fished him out of the water, and then tortured him to find out if he had sent a message and he never answered the word. Later, after being brutally interrogated, he was led through the streets of Yokohama. He was spat on, he was hung up by his thumbs and tortured. Finally, at the end of the war, he was released. He was known as the savior of Ceylon. But you know, while Ceylon was enjoying deliverance, 
He had no idea what Len Burchell was going through in a Japanese prison. And it may be that you have never come to understand what Jesus went through to save you. And it may be you have never grasped what he did, what he suffered, what he gave, what he sacrificed in order to save you. But this is how you can be right with God. Christ's death on the cross is where he suffered for sins, where he died for our sins, where he died for sinners, where he died for the ungodly. He can make you right with God. As my dear brother Baker tells you more about the Lord Jesus, make this the night that you trust him and he will reconcile you to God. Second Corinthians, please, in chapter number one. <clears throat> Second Corinthians, chapter number one. I think you will find that what I have tonight will follow very closely with what you have already heard. It's great to see everyone who's come. I know for many of you, this Monday has been a busy day of work. And um, for those of you who are young, a busy day of play this summer day, but thank you for being with us. I would just ask for your attention for the next 25 minutes. Second Corinthians chapter one, and we will read from verse 18. <clears throat> but as God is true, our word toward you was not yes and no. For the son of God, Jesus Christ, who was, now here's our word, who was preached was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now, this is a very confusing uh, verse. If we were going to have a discussion, a panel discussion, I would be turning often to my brother here on my right and others as well to wonder what this verse means. Commentators are divided, but they are not divided on the big picture understanding of this verse. Do you know what it's saying? It's saying that God is true. It's saying that the message that they preached was capital T R U T H truth, truth. And what you have heard, if you were listening to Mr. Higgins tonight was three questions about truth, not necessarily about political opinions. All of those three questions are questions of objective, actual truth. And that's what it's saying here. That he is, uh, Paul is actually grounding some of the changes he made in his own travels. And he's saying, I'm not unreliable because I'm representing somebody who's not unreliable. I am representing somebody who is faithful. And the message that he has entrusted me to proclaim is also not unreliable, which you Christians in Corinth, you know, for all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. In other words, all the promises are true. The message is true. So now over to 1 Timothy. For just a, a text, First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy chapter two and verse number three. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. And one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The word gospel means good news. If someone were to ask me for a short list of reasons for why the gospel is good news, I'm not sure for the Christians here what your first reason would be. Maybe you would think of how much it has changed your life. Maybe you look at the person uh, who shares the home with you, your spouse, and you think, I never would have known them were it not for the gospel. Maybe you look all around your life so totally changed by this message and the transformation of a life, something you could have tonight, something you could have tonight. That transformation is a great thing. But if you were to put me in a corner and say, Joey, what is reason number one for why it is good news? My answer would be this. It's true. It's true. 
There are messages on planet Earth that will transform your life. P90X or whatever else is popular today transforms people's lives. Other religious messages have transformed scoundrels into very nicely living religious people. And they look a certain part. But my friend, the most important thing of the gospel is this. Paul says it in Ephesians chapter one. The gospel of your salvation is the word of truth. Truth. You see, Christians are no different than, than you in the sense that, you know, when I get an email from the prime minister of Dubai saying that 6.7 million has been transferred into my account if I submit my social security number and my bank routing number, I spam it as well, my friend, right? I do the same. You know why? That would make me feel unbelievably good. That would change my life. But I spam it and you spam it. Why? It's not true. It's not true. Listen, whatever message you have believed, however much it may have changed your life, however far back it takes your ancestry, if it's not the truth, you have an obligation to your own mind. You have an obligation to as a rational human being and in the sight of God to drop whatever it is. To drop. The reason we preach the gospel is because it's true. It's truth. That's what you've heard tonight. The truth about God, the truth about sin and our accountability to that God and the truth about what God did for that. All three questions were questions of truth. And so I would like to uh, continue and looking at this great subject of truth. I would agree with what you have already heard. You know, it was actually uh, it's actually credited to a man who is by no means a Christian. Uh, I even shudder to think of his name as because I think of where he might be today. But a man by the name of Frederick Nietzsche said, at least it's accredited to him saying. There are many people who don't want to hear the truth. Because they don't want their illusions destroyed. People who don't want to hear the truth. Because they don't want their illusions destroyed. Now, I can tell you for myself, there are things that I would like to think are true. There are things I would like to think moving in this world. I would like to think. Just as, as an observer, even coming here as a visitor, first time here on the East Coast, meeting different people. There are obser observations I have made as a human being. And I would like to think that I have given people the benefit of the doubt. And I would like to think that the observation is grounded in something that is actual and real. But the fact is, I could be very vastly deceived by the good impression or the smile or the words of people. But there is one place I will never be deceived. The God of truth. The God of truth in the word of truth, the Bible. And this message, my friend, is a message of truth. Absolute truth. Now, one of the things that especially those of you who have come and listened to the gospel through these uh, through the last week, you will know that one of the things both of us have been stressing, uh, especially during the end of the message, is the question of belief. Or as Mr. Higgins said tonight, resting all your weight right now when it comes to believing something as far as i'm concerned there's only one criteria is it true that's the great thing about truth you know truth doesn't need a deep voice to hold it up truth doesn't need an emotional experience to justify it truth doesn't need clever advertising Truth just stands on the virtue of it being the truth. It needs nothing else. And my friend tonight, what you have heard and what I hope you will hear in the next few minutes is truth. And what you are called upon by God, not by the gospel hall, not by the Christians, but by God is to believe the truth, to rest on the truth. That's why it's being proclaimed for you to receive it, receive the truth. I want to use a word that you've already heard in this meeting tonight, the truth about the chasm, because we've read that here in First Timothy chapter two. The chasm, do you know what a chasm is? A great divide, a great divide, the chasm caused by sin. 
Then I want you to notice the truth again found in 1 Timothy 2, the truth about the cross. The cross that, again, it seems like I'm stealing my brother's notes, but I don't have them up here, I promise. The truth about the cross that bridged the divide. Lastly, I want to talk about the truth of the cost of the choice you will make tonight. The truth about the chasm. You know, my friend, according to the Bible, again, this is the words of truth. Some people say, do you believe the gospel because it makes you feel good? No. No, I am not, as you can tell, a very, uh, well, I shouldn't say it like that. I I am a very young man. (laughs) And yet already in my life, I have stood beside graves of people that I knew. And as far as I know, according to the truth, they're in hell. I don't believe the gospel because it makes me feel good, friends. It doesn't make me feel good. There's a man directly related to our family. And if he were to die tonight as he is, though he is an extremely religious man, Though going to meeting every single night is not something he does for two weeks, but something he has done all his life for all ever since he's been born. You know, my friend, if he were to die tonight, he would be in hell. And so I don't stand here and preach the gospel because it makes me feel good. Would that make you feel good? But the fact is, it's the truth. The fact is, it's the truth. It's fact, friend. Fact. And the fact, first of all, is the fact about the chasm that sin has caused. The chasm between us and God. You see, when sin came into this world, when Adam and Eve, when they took that fruit and sinned against God, when they broke his law, his one law, don't take of the fruit. When they broke that law right away, instantly, There was a divide. I don't know if you know this or if you understand this, but in the Garden of Eden, God would come down and walk with that couple. He would move with them in this world, a world that was vastly different than it is today. But he would he would enjoy friendship with this couple. But when they took the fruit, when they sinned and when God came down, do you know what it says they were doing? It's shocking. It doesn't shock us maybe today, but you know what it says they were doing? It says they hid. They hid from God. They hid from him because sin had caused a divide. And when God held them accountable and and, and brought them to give an account for what they had done, they were driven out from that garden. And a flaming sword, a flaming sword with an angel was put into place to never let them come back. And a divide took place. And theologians and preachers and scholars have called what happened a fall. Do you know why? Was it because Eve tripped? It was because from the heights of communion with God, man fell a distance far from God. Why? Because of sin. What sin? Murder? No. Taking a piece of fruit that God said, thou shalt not. Now, my friend, how about you tonight? Have you done anything that God has said, thou shalt not? Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You see, there is a divide. We have been born into this world, divided from God, separated as as an amazing, a, a huge chasm, a huge distance between us and our God. And the reason for the separation is not because... God doesn't like us. He just set the world up that way. He just has something against human beings. He's just playing an experiment. No, the reason is because the first of us, Adam, decided to make a choice in rebellion against that God. And though we had enjoyed communion, it was broken. It was broken. And we are at a distance, born at a distance. And you see the reason people end up in hell is not because they come to meet God and their good and their bad is weighed up and then their bad outweighs it and so they go to hell. No, 
It's because they've been living in this world. If you tonight are not saved, if you have never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, you are living at a distance from God. Maybe you've never committed murder, but you are living at a distance from God for your sin. It was how you were born, born in sin, says the Bible, born separated from God. And if you die separated from God, you remain separated from God. And that's what hell is and the lake of fire. It is to be forever separated from God, from all that God is. And only to be filled with all of God's wrath and anger. And so you see the chasm is due to sin. It is our sin that has separated. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, your sin has separated you from your God. And so sin has caused this chasm. Between us and God. But then we have read this, these words. That God is not looking at you. And, and almost like if you, can, if you can see it tonight. If your eyes, if the eyes of your mind have moved beyond the tent. And beyond the preachers. And if you can see the chasm between us and God. The great distance so far. God has not stood on the other end and say, there you are. Ha ha. Too bad. No, look what the verse says. God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What truth? That there is one God and one bridge between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Do you know what God is saying in this verse? He's saying the truth that he wants you to understand. Is not just that sin has caused the distance, but that Christ has bridged the distance. That Christ has come into this world. Now, you see, I come from a state where if I use this illustration, it would be perfectly clear. The illustration of the Mackinac Bridge. But I am giving you the benefit of the death that you all know what a bridge is. Now, there's one very important thing about a bridge. If it's going to be useful. It has to touch the both sides. If it doesn't touch the both sides, it's not a bridge. It's a tourist attraction. It still might light up at Christmas time or the 4th of July, and it might be fun to go visit. But if it doesn't touch both sides, there's no point going across it. You see, for a bridge, now just listen, please, tonight. If we are ever going to be connected back to God, the bridge has to touch God. If we're going to be connected back to God, it has to touch God. That's why, by the way, church will never take you to heaven. That's why baptism will never take you to heaven. That's why good works will never take you to heaven. That's why all reformation and all kinds of uh, self-improvement will never take you to heaven. Why? It doesn't touch the other side. It doesn't touch the other side. But then it has to touch our side. It has to touch man, human beings. So what do you need? If there's a bridge that's going to bridge the chasm, that's going to connect God and men, is you need someone who is both God and man. That's why there's only one Savior. That's why there's only one. Because there's only one person in this universe who is both God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. That's the only way. It is because God in matchless grace looked at lost, fallen, distant man and their rebellion. And he came here. He became a man. And he came very small in the virgin womb, born in a small, obscure village, living his life in this in this world, in our world. He moved here. This air that we breathe, he breathed. He moved in this world. And yet without any sin of his own, he was God and a perfect, holy man. And yet he went almost, if I can say reverently, on a beeline, almost with one purpose. And the reason I say that is because in the Gospels, all these details that we would all as Christians love to know about the Lord Jesus. It's like we don't even get to know so many things. He's on a mission. He's moving. Where is he going? He's going to a cross. Why is he going there? The Bible says right here, here's the truth. To give himself 
a ransom for all. You see, for the bridge, to connect the two sides, it has to deal with the thing that's caused the divide. What's caused the divide? You've heard it. Thank you very much. Sin has caused the divide. Sin has divided us from God. And so not only can the bridge, not only must the bridge be God and man, but it must deal with sin. The only way to deal with sin, according to the Bible, is the soul that sins must die. And the wages of sin is death. So God became a man when the fullness of time was come, says the Bible. God became a man made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. He came into this world to go to the cross to suffer for sin. That's what he's doing on the cross. He is there to suffer for sin. According to the Bible, Isaiah 53 and 5, my favorite verse, if you're allowed one. My favorite verse is Isaiah 53 and 5. You know what it says he was doing on the cross? Something a whole nation of people has yet to realize, but will realize. You know what it says they were doing? He was wounded for our transgressions. He's being crushed for our sin. All of the punishment. All of the wrath of God for our sin is being placed on the Lord Jesus. He's dealing with it. He's suffering for it, according to 1 Peter 3. He's being punished for it. And then under that penalty of sin, the death penalty, the Bible says he died. for it. Christ died for our sin. Christ died for the ungodly. And after he died, now here's the question. You look. You look at that cross, if you were there, and you see the form of a man without even anything to cover. His body has been bathed in his own blood. He's not even recognizable as a human being. And you look at him and you say, it doesn't look like that man could ever connect anyone to God. But you should see him Sunday morning. <laughs> or... They took his body down from the cross. They put him in the tomb. The stone sealed that tomb shut. And on Sunday morning, as you heard so clearly last night, up from the grave, he rose. He rose again. He rose again in power, in glory. He rose again, and God was saying, the bridge is set. The bridge has connected both sides, and God is saying it's dealt with the problem. Dealt with the problem according to a holy God, according to a, the standard of a holy God. He is saying there's nothing else I need when it comes to sin. Jesus has come. He has died for sin. And what his death and what his death has accomplished is enough. Now. That brings us now to this last point. A costly choice. You see, so many people, <clears throat> they look at the bridge. They hear about Christ. They hear that he's the only way. And I hope you understand that he is the only way. I hope that's been clear tonight. And they look at him and they say, yeah, I know he's the only way. I know he's important. And they never can imagine an eternity where they're not on the other side of the bridge. They can never imagine that one day they'll wake up still separated from God. They just always assume someday, somehow I'll be over there. But it never becomes urgent. It never becomes a priority. It never becomes vastly important. And so they stay on the other side. And there are people who know so much about that bridge. So much. I was, we were talking to a young man, the first series of gospel meetings I ever did, which was only six years ago. Mr. Higgins will tell you his first tomorrow night. But the first series of gospel meetings I ever did was only six years ago. And we we're talking to a young man. And he wanted to be saved. And the preaching partner I had at the time, he turned to him and he read John chapter 19, verse 30. It is finished. And he said, what do you think that means? And here's a young man. He knew so much about the bridge. What would you say? It is finished. What does that mean? You know, what he said he finished the work the father gave him to do. It's quite a bit. He knows about the bridge. <laughs> I wouldn't have said that as an 11 year old boy. So much about the bridge he knows. Maybe there's people here and you know he was virgin born, the Lord Jesus. You know he's the eternal son of God. You can put your check mark to every creed through church history, but you've never, you've never placed your weight on the bridge. You've never stepped onto the bridge. Again, that's the only way you reach the other side. And I have to tell you here tonight, the Bible teaches as a, as a statement of truth that you tonight are a free will creature. 
that you are not a puppet in the sight of God, that you do not stand on the other side of the bridge and God is somehow going to pick you up and put you onto the bridge. God is going to offer you the gospel and you must make the choice to trust his son, to rest on Christ. And the moment you do that, you know what's going to happen? You'll be connected to God. Connected in a personal relationship. Not a relationship you have to enjoy in a church. Although we would preach to, uh, you know, be, be a part of a Bible-believing church. But no, a personal relationship. You know, when COVID-19 shut down the world, I still spoke to God. He still spoke to me. I still enjoyed communion with God and a walk with God. My friend, do you know anything about that? Do you know a personal relationship with God? The only way you can know that is if your sin has been dealt with. The Bible says the only way it can happen through this one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself for the ransomed. No, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Got that? Not gave himself for the ransom. As a ransom for all. That's why I preach the gospel to everyone. That's why. It's for everyone. But it's the costliest choice you will make tonight. The truth about the chasm. That's a truth now. Whether you like it or not. Whether you makes it makes you feel good or not. Sin has separated us from God. It's a truth about the cross. That God has found satisfaction in the cross. Evidenced by raising his son from the dead. To bridge that chasm. But you are left with the choice of whether you will trust Christ or not. It's a costly choice. Because sometimes life on that chasm feels good. Right? Sometimes there's more friends over here. More popularity. But I can tell you this. It would be far more costly to not cross. Because to not cross. Is to open your eyes in hell. And the patriarch says. Between us and you. It's a great Gulf fixed. Chasm is still there. Trust Christ tonight. You'll be safe.